Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to, uh, we're going to celebrate this morning uh, some things in, by way of study. Uh, this is the time of the year which completes and begins a new circle. Um, we, we've started, this, there's lots of beginnings and endings in God's, char- in God's character, in his, in his mindset, in His uh, instructions. And the reason for this is because He's always wanting something to be new and fresh all the time. And so there's a number of beginnings of the years, there's a number of beginnings of, of certain things. Uh, this is the first month of the year concerning the feasts and festivals and the times and the moeds of God. Uh, the, the month of Tishrei in, in the Hebrew. And it changes uh, each year. This year, the feasts and the festivals are as early as they can possibly be on the calendar, on what we would call the Gregorian calendar. Next year, we actually jump almost a whole month uh, into October when, when these th- things are. And because uh, there are many years when an extra whole extra month is added uh, to the Hebrew calendar, it goes right, p- right to the earliest time and then it jumps uh, forward a whole month and catches up on itself. And that's the way God's designed it. But today we're going to study and, and, and uh, 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 get into the word concerning two different feasts one of which is prescribed in the Word of God, and one, is one, one which is all about the Word of God. Uh, the two feasts is uh, Shemini Etzaret and Simchat Torah. Shemini, uh, um, if you're counting in Hebrew, you'll get a Chad, Shtaim, Shelosh, Arba, Chamesh, Shesh, Sheva, Shemone. Shemone uh, is uh, where we get the word Shemini from, which means the eighth. Okay? So, eighth or eight, uh, the Shemini Etzaret, or the eighth assembly. So, on the eighth day of a seven-day event. So, you've got the seven days of, what have we just celebrated? Sukkot, or Feast of Tabernacles. And then on the next day, the eighth day, it's like there's an extra day added uh, to this whole feast, um, which we celebrate as Shemini Etzaret. In Israel... On the same day is a festival or a rejoicing called Simchat Torah, which is, literally means rejoicing in the Torah or rejoicing in the Word of God. Uh, in the diaspora, which uh, the diaspora is a word for the Jews that are dispersed throughout the nations, uh, it is celebrated the following day, after the day after the eighth day, which would not necessarily be the ninth day, but into the beginnings of a new day. The eighth day is also the first day, which might sound a little strange, until you think of it in terms of a week. Okay, so if you're going to count from, uh, all the way from uh, Sunday, Yom Rishon, which simply means the first, which is what we call Sunday, Yom Rishon, and then we go through one, uh, one day, two, two day, three day, four day, five day, and then the Shabbat, uh, no, sorry, six day, then Shabbat, and then the eighth will be the first day again, right? So we've got uh, the, the eighth day, which is the first day. First day, And, and all that means is going to come clear to you in a minute as to why that is. So on Tishrei 22, uh, which was just a few days ago, uh, both Shemini Etzaret and Simchat Torah, join the Torah, uh, are celebrated in Israel. Now, scripturally, we're looking at Numbers 29, and verse 35, and we see there, it says, On the eighth day you shall have a sacred assembly, you, should, you shall do no customary work. Uh, Leviticus 23 and verse 39 says, Also on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day a Sabbath rest. Which... Like I said, can sound confusing. How can you have eighth, an eighth day off seven days? But it's simply the next one. It's said that way because it's also an allusion to the eighth day being the first day. Okay, just keep that in your mind and it'll, it'll come clear to you. Um, the seven days of Sukkot, or Feast of Tabernacles, are representative of the six days of man's time on the earth, or the 6,000 years. A day is a thousand years. Uh, we've, said, we've gone through this quite a few times. Let's see if you guys know what it is. Uh, the first 2,000 years are the days of, can you remember? Chaos. Days of chaos. Remember, since the fall of Adam through to the next 2,000 years, what happened at the end of those first 2,000 years? 
God gave man the, the Torah, the Word of God. So the next two years are the two, the two days of the Torah, or the days of the law, or the days of the Word of God. Uh, the, the t- then what happened after 4,000 years? Or, or should I say, who happened? Jesus, the Word was made flesh. After 2,000 years of the Word in the earth, the Word himself was able to step into history. And from that time on became the time of the church age or a time of the Gentiles, which is only 2,000 years long, where not only Israel, but every person who had ever received the, 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 the Israeli, the Jewish Messiah would be able to become a part of the family of God. And so we've got the 2,000-year church age, or time of the Gentiles, and at the end of 6,000 years, we enter into the... (laughs) The nothing? (laughs) What happens? Okay, let's do it on a week. Okay, Um, so you start, the day, the week starts on 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 the Yom Rishon, which is our Sunday. So then you go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then the... Shabbat, the Sabbath. So the seventh day, or the 7,000 years, is a Shabbat. It's a rest. Now, what happens on the earth in that 7,000th year, or to begin that 7,000th year? The, the, The Messiah returns, that's right. Jesus himself comes back, puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, it's split asunder, and he rules and reigns for a thousand years, literally giving us a rest from human government. Oh my goodness, that would be great. <laughs> a, a, a planetary rest from human wisdom and attempts at governing for an entire thousand years. That's a, that is a wonderful Shabbat. That is a great Sabbath. Praise the Lord. With Jesus himself being the, the king of the earth and ruling and reigning over that time. <clears throat> okay. What happens then after seven days? What happens next? Now, if we go in, in if we're counting in in sequence, then after seven comes eight, and yet it is the first of a brand new existence, because the Bible says the whole heavens and earth will be rolled up like a scroll, and God will create a new heavens and a new earth, and in the eighth day it is the beginning or first day of a whole new existence. Actually, it will be kin to what was right at the very beginning after God said light be and placed man on the earth. Only this time, according to Romans chapter 5, much more now in Christ. So we'll not only be on the earth uh, having dominion of the earth, but doing so also seated in Christ on the throne of heaven. Adam didn't have that. His authority went up to but not including the throne of God. The new, the new uh, era that comes on the eighth day, the first day of the beginning of, of the new heavens and the new earth, has man not only ruling the earth, but from a seated position in Christ on the throne of God. That is phenomenal. That's exciting. This is in our soon and very soon coming future. Praise the Lord. So, we have an eighth day or the new day. Now, one of the interesting dynamics about Shemini Etzaret, the, the, um, the eighth assembly being on the first day, is uh, the, the, the thing that it's known best for in Judaism is a particular prayer service that takes place. Um, the prayer service is called uh, Tefillat Geshem, or the prayer for the rain. Now this, is a, now, now, this has both natural and spiritual significance. Because obviously, in, a, in an environment such as in Israel, uh, where uh, the, the society revolved around the crops and the seasons of the plantings and the rains and the harvests, this was very, very significant that there needed to be rain. And there would be a special prayer for the rain during this particular uh, service. Uh, where the words are inserted into the prayer service, Mashiv Haruach Umorid Hageshem, who makes the wind blow and the rain descend. And so there's a, there's a call on God for, for rain to come. Now, we know 
that in the time to come, Zechariah's prophecy says that, and this is now in our future, this is not looking back, this is in our future, Zechariah says when the Messiah comes to rule and reign on the earth, throughout that thousand year rule and reign, every person on the earth has to come up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And whatever nation does not come to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles gets no what? Rain. No rain. Rain is significant. And so we've just, this is really now the stepping into that rain. Now, what prophetic uh, uh, significance does this have for us? It's a prophetically a time for us to pray for not just natural rain, and you know what, it'd be good to have some more rain. We had a little bit of rain yesterday morning here. It'd be good to have some more rain in this nation. It'd be good to have more rain in Israel. Uh, it's been wonderful to see the Galilee rise just a little bit, but they need more. Uh, it's good to have rain on the earth. Uh, it, we, we believe uh, that, I believe, that God says that while the earth remains, uh, while summer and winter remains, sea time and harvest remains, all of this, all of this takes place. The, uh, is the earth still here? Yeah. Right, so then all of those things will take place. Despite the, the collective ignorance of so many scientists. <laughs> Can I say it that way? I mean, that may sound a little harsh, but it's amazing how many, how many men of science, women of science, have come together to bring a conclusion on the page with the announcement, we are, this is absolutely fact, we're 95% sure. That's the statement that was made. And guess what God does? Works in the 5% outside of man's wisdom. 95% of man's wisdom, I tell you what, God doesn't even need the 5%. God will not allow this planet to, 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 uh, uh, to fold on and in itself. He is holding this thing together by the Word of God. It, it, you know, it's, it's, so, it's not funny, actually. It's sad. I remember, remember when we had some pretty serious floods here in Brisbane? And I remember just before those floods, we had drought, and everyone's like, drought, drought, you know, we're just going to, this is it, global warming, this is it, we're all going to fry now, no, we're never going to get any more rain again, this is it now for Australia. And, and, and some of the old-timers were, were scratching their heads saying, but this, this always happens. We always get drought and then we always get rain. And, and they were trying to warn the councils, actually saying, don't let people build. The reason we used to build houses on stilts was because after the dry, drought comes the flood. And so then whole councils allowed building down in the flood plains and what happens? Every now and then you get a big flood and... All the houses get washed away. Isn't that true? You guys have been around in Brisbane long enough to see a few of these things happen now. And so the wisdom of man, it's amazing how short-sighted we get. We think we're so, we get so involved in our own temporal uh, uh, thought that we forget the longevity of God. You know, it's amazing. Even in church we do this. So sometimes the modern church looks at itself, at itself to think at, as, if, as if this modern church in the last, let's say the last decade, has been what the church has been for thousands of years. It hasn't. This, what we see as church now predominantly has only existed for such a tiny little period of time. I mean, what, I mean, what happened before, you know, lights and projectors, as wonderful as they are. No, no, church has been around, the, the gathering of the saints has been around a lot longer. In fact, it's amazing. You, you, you talk to, uh, I've had a pr privilege of speaking to some uh, priests uh, in, a, in Catholic, uh, from the Catholic church and, uh, and so forth, and it's amazing to hear the perspective that they have. You, you know, you, think to, you talk to them and say, well, you know, they might have a church service and there's only th three old ladies left in the congregation. And you think, well, you know, are you going to sell the building? No, a couple of hundred years, it'll be full again. They, they, they literally think on a much longer term perspective, it doesn't matter if there's only three people in there now, in a couple of hundred years it'll be full again because they've seen it over the centuries, the cycles that have gone on with, with different things that have taken place. We have such a, a at times, a, such a minuscule view on our, on our moment. And we need to open our eyes and open wide uh, our eyes and see what really is going on. We are at the end of days, I believe. And we do need to pray for rain. Why? Because we need to see 
the pews full again. In every church. I mean, revival. The spiritual reign as well as the natural reign. James 5.7 says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the Father... You know, before I read the rest of that verse, you know, it's amazing to me. I've looked over and, and I tell you, I've come under this pressure many times myself. There's, there are times when you can look and, and, and at, at, at the achievements or the things that, that have been happening and what we've been doing and you think to yourself, Lord, are we getting anywhere? And, and yet that's, that's such a silly thing to say because when I ask, whenever I ask the Lord that, He always shows me over the next week, he, I, I get the privilege of sitting with different ones in the, from the congregation and hearing the testimonies and the things they've achieved and, and w- how the Word of God has impacted their life and stuff. Again, we look at things as if the razzmatazz and the glitter is what it's all about, and yet the, the heart and the growth of an individual is so important. And, and sometimes we can come into this place of impatience, and yet James says here, therefore be patient, brethren. And it's not a passiveness, it's an active endurance. Keep on keeping on, brethren. Keep on keeping on, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits. See how God waits. Connect your patience to His. For the what? The precious fruit of the earth. I'll tell you this, and, and I genuinely mean this as my heart. You know what? If all of this technology and beautiful instruments and everything and chairs and lights and even the walls and the roof, if this was all gone, if we had no access to any of this anymore, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. Because the precious fruit of the earth, God does not even look at all this stuff and He's not impressed. He's glad that we can use it and He'll bless us with it. But this is not what impresses Him. What impresses him, what he longs for, what he, what he desires to connect with is the heart of the individual that shows up to, to relate with him. We could be sitting under a tree out there somewhere and, ha- and, ju- and, it, and ju- have as just as an important, just as much church. But one Sunday, maybe we should do it. One Sunday, maybe we should just get a, a big... A, I don't know, there's probably not enough room under a tree, but just get some big kind of... <laughs> brush arbor type, I don't know, some kind of shade cloth, something, set it, set it up out there and just worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Maybe we should just do that one. It would be a lot less work, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because the heart of God just simply wants to connect with the heart of His children. Praise God. And He wants us to pray for Him. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth waiting patiently for it until it receives. This is what God's waiting for. That what? The, pre- the former, sorry, till it receives the early and the latter rain. Then he says again, you also be patient. There's two instructions now to be patient, to be endurant, to wait for, to hang on for, to, to hold out for. Don't give up before. Verse 9, do not grumble against one another. Isn't it funny? When we're waiting for something, we can get agitated. When we're waiting for something, it's almost a time when people just start getting grumpy with each other. Just waiting. You know, it's, are we there yet? Statements from the back seat. And, and I tell you, sometimes there's a pressure on pastors, and I've spoken with many pastors, and sometimes the pressure's there. And these precious pastors, I mean, some of them just... You know, I, I've met some that I believe just personally, I believe they just work too hard. I mean, they're out every single night and every hour of the day trying to, trying to run around caring for the flock. I mean, uh, I mean, and don't get me wrong, it's important to do that. But sometimes I've seen these guys burn out doing it, running from, running from uh, one emergency to the next and, and, and then, they, then, they, then they're out of the ministry because they just can't survive it. I've seen it over and over again. I've seen too many. I know some... Friends of mine now, you know, ministers and friends of mine now, who I just don't know how they keep up with themselves. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes they just crash and they're sick because their body can't handle it. They're just so worn down, they've got nothing left to fight, you know, anything else. Uh, it, it's, important. it's important, though, in these times that we, we maintain a consistency of patience, a consistency of love, a consistency of care for one another, 
a consistency uh, in our worship, a consistency in the Word, just a consistency. Why? Because there's sometimes, I, again, I've spoken to pastor friends of mine, and they've said, I'm just under so much pressure from the church. We, we, you know, they, 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 they're just saying, why is there not more people in the church? Why are the offerings not bigger? Why this? Why, why aren't we seeing more breakthroughs? Why aren't we seeing more healings? Why aren't we seeing... And, and, it's like, and the, this is what pastors say to me. Like, I can do anything about it. Seriously. There's not one thing you or I can do to make more miracles happen in this church or any other place. The only thing we can do that perhaps at times we're not doing is simply laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. I mean, actually doing the action of it. But the, what happens is, it, and I've seen this in my life and I've seen it in so many other people's lives, is that the pressure is greatest the moment before the rain. Have you ever noticed, have you never noticed how heavy the atmosphere is just before a great big downpour? Especially in, in uh, climates like, like Brisbane and, and north of here, when, when just before a, 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 a summer rain, I mean, you can hardly breathe. It's so thick and hot and just heavy. And, and again, you can get quite cranky in that kind of an atmosphere for too long. And then there's the rain, you know, and, it, and that freshness breathes through, you know. Like the fragrance after the rain. Do you remember, you remember that song? You don't know that song? Oh, it's a beautiful song. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's like that, and you know that, you know that smell when the rains come and that freshness that's there. Listen, folks, this is the encouragement James is giving us now. The pressure can be on so much just before the breakthrough, just before the rains. Be patient. Stay consistent. Keep holding on. Don't let go of the promises of God. Don't let go. You know, some of the greatest revivals on the planet have happened and in, broken forth from tiny little, inside tiny little wooden churches of, of locations of no great significance. Why? Because God just decided to zap that particular place? No. Because of the faithful prayer and consistency of praying saints leading up to that period of time. They just weren't prepared to ever give in. And, and you know, Brother, Brother uh, Hagen rather used to say, if you're prepared to stand forever, it won't take very long. When that perspective is in your mindset, if you're prepared to stand forever, if you're prepared to go to the grave, but still believing then when, if, when you get your breakthrough, it's not going to seem like hardly any time at all. That's how we need to continue to stand. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. This is New Testament. He's standing there, ready, waiting to come. I mean, I, I believe Jesus is it's just, I mean, he's just, he's just, any second, I mean, he's just ready. I mean, that's, if anything, he's probably angels holding him back. I mean, Jesus, he wants to come, you know. God wants him to come. But it's not until the, 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 the time the Father says, remember in the, the Jewish uh, wedding feast, that it's in the, reser the actual wedding days reser reserved in the mind of the Father. And he says when the bridegroom can go and collect his bride. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And then there's the seven days. The seven days there of the wedding feast. And, and, and contra to what many people have thought, the, the wedding supper is at the end of seven days, not at the beginning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hosea chapter 6 Verse 3 says, Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. Hallelujah. He's, and the Scriptures are putting these two things and connecting them. You know, what we've seen in, in terms of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the former, and what we've seen in the latter days of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and renewals, this is talking of a time when there will be a, 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 a convergence of both of those 
in a revival and in a way and in a move on the earth like we've never seen before. Praise God. A glorious time. Joel chapter 2, 23 says, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For He has given you the former rain faithfully, and He will cause the rain to come down for you. Now listen to this. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Well, if we've just had Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the new year concerning the feasts, what would that place us in right now? The first month. Hallelujah. Again, we see it time after time after time, studying these scriptures, pointing to this time of year. Hallelujah. Oh, that gets me excited. Zechariah 10.1 Now, listen to this. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. That, type, that talks about His glory. That type talks about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it also talks about prosperity. That grass in the field is ample provision. Ample provision. Ample food. Ample provision for you during this time as well. Hallelujah. You glad about that? I think that's wonderful. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. When is the latter rain in Israel? Right now. This is the time. You've got two seasons of the rain. The former rain, which comes around and starts around the time of the earlier feasts in the year. And then you've got the fall feasts or the autumn feasts, which in, obviously is not fall or autumn in Australia. We're now in spring. But in the northern hemisphere, this is the fall or the autumn time. And this is when, this is right now when those latter rains begin. So right now, according to this, ask the Lord for rain when? In the time of the latter rain. So we, can, we need to be praying now. Again, these are holy convocations. We should be connecting to these things in this way. The latter rain is the fall or autumn, as I said. The rain is a type of the Holy Spirit, and water itself is a type of the Word of God. Washing with the water of the Word. So, but can you hear how connected those two things? If rain is a type of the Holy Spirit and water is a type of the Word, well, you don't get water without rain. <laughs> rain is what brings the water to the earth. So the Word and the Spirit are so perfectly always connected with one another. Beautifully. Beautifully. As mentioned before, one of the best known elements of Shemini Itzaret, the Eighth Assembly, is the prayer for rain. So just a few days ago, on this particular day, Jews in Jerusalem and in the diaspora were all praying for this rain, agreeing before God for this outpouring of rain. Praise God. As a church, we need to be in agreement with that only on a spiritual plane as well as a physical one. Hallelujah. And listen, it's not missed. It's not missed on, on studied uh, Jews and rabbis either. They understand. They never look at a natural only. They always look at everything that's in the Scripture of a natural stance. They always search for the spiritual application of those things. Always. There's always a mystical application in their minds of what they read in the natural. Now we have greater revelation in one sense of, of how the Holy Spirit has opened our eyes to understand some of these things. They have the same revelation, only haven't connected Mashiach to it. And now we can. Praise the Lord. And pray for the unveiling of their eyes as well. The time of Sukkot, the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, leads into Simchat Torah and the Shemini Etzaret. The eighth day represents the new beginnings, the time immediately after the millennial reign of Messiah, and it's right, uh, it's right that we also rejoice in the living Torah, or the Word, or the Torah made flesh. Now, I want you to think of this. Time in a Greco-Roman mindset, which is how most of the Western world thinks, is linear. It's on a flat linear plane. You've got a, we call it a time line, right? Because it's a, it's a, it's a linear, <laughs> right? Linear. That's what it comes from. But God doesn't think of time linear. He thinks of time and sees time and created time as circular. 
Now, sometimes people say, well, that's a bit hard to get my head around. Not really. Okay? So imagine a circle. Imagine a circle right here. Now, put it at the top. 12. Here, 3. Here, 6. Here, 9. What did you just create? And do you think in time as a circle every day? Yes, you do. It goes around. It goes around. So now, listen to this. 12 o'clock, or let's call it lunchtime, midday. Midday happens... How, how often? Once a day, every day. It's a common thread through time. Is that right? The sun is in the mid, mid sky at midday, every day, every day. Or every single time. So you could, you could then, on a circle, plot midday as a point on that, which we do. We, we mark it with a 12 at the top. Okay? Now, turn that sideways and see time then as an escalating circle coming up like a spring, like a big spring. That 12 o'clock axis still runs through every day of time as it, in, as it increases. Is that correct? Now, do the same with the cross. Now the cross was a central point in history not the exact center of history, but a central point of history which reached both into the past and into the future. So if you imagine the, circuit, the circular time, mark the cross on there. Now turn it sideways and both upwards and downwards in time, that cross has an axis all the way through time. It's like a portal or a connector between all time so that those before the cross could look forward to the cross and connect with it even though it hadn't happened yet. So Isaiah says, by his stripes we are healed. He didn't say will be. He was connecting with it into the future, an event that hadn't taken place yet, connecting with it and bringing it by faith into his now. And it hadn't even taken place yet. Well, it had in one sense. Because of that access, that access goes all the way through to the beginning of time, and the Bible says that the Lamb was slain before... The foundation of the world. How can we say that? Because that axis of time runs all the way through. And it will go all the way through to the beyond us into the future now so that, so that people, before, people after the cross can make this statement with Paul, I was crucified. Well, how's that possible that happened 2,000 years ago? <coughs> because you're standing on that time axis throughout circular time. It, it, it just works. It works beautifully. And, and, and it's like time can fold in on itself when you appropriate these feasts and festivals. So what happens when we actually celebrate, this is why as a church we go through these things. As When we celebrate the feasts and festivals of the Lord, which we know are called holy convocations, which means dress rehearsals, Okay, so when we do them, it's not like a dress rehearsal of something that will happen way off into the future. We actually act like we're there. It's a faith thing. What happens is, supernaturally, you actually connect with that day. You do. It's a portal in time. God has put the, the, se the seasons, He has put the specific feasts of the Lord into the Word of God that connect both forwards and backwards. They, it's like, you've heard of, have you heard of wormholes or, or you know, how time, they, the scientists explain how time can, like a piece of paper that can fold on itself and touch. And they actually, they actually conceptually believe time travel is possible. Now I'm not saying we should try and make that happen. What I'm, what I'm saying though is they've connected to something they don't understand they can't explain, but conceptually can see it's possible. Why? Because within time itself, that's how time was created. It connects with itself forwards and backwards. Is this too much? Is it, uh, I mean, obviously this is coming out of me meditating and reading and studying a whole lot of stuff. But let me tell you something. This is, this is how faith, all of a sudden, when, you, when you've got hope, which is the picture of something in the future, faith now, by the words 
The, the words, the creative words that you speak can reach into, grab a hold of something that's for you and bring it into your net. And by faith, you've got it even if you can't see it. You've connected with that thing and then all of the universe, everything in creation that God created now starts to just, it's like a, going down a, a, a plug hole. It just starts to converge on your faith to make that a reality. Isn't that good? Praise God. I preach myself happy here this morning, I tell you what. It's a holy convocation. Don't think of it just as a celebration of something that's about to happen. Think of it as a celebration where you actually connect with the day itself. So we actually connect with the return of the Messiah. We actually connect with these different things. We are connecting right now with the eighth day, the beginning of a whole new era. Woo! Praise God. Man, that's pretty exciting to me. The overlap of these days, the 8th and the 1st, is on purpose. Um, it's to show an overlap of the two ages, the two seasons. It also, if you really want to get into the study, we don't have time to go into today, but if you really want to get into it, there is also a parallel of, of things that take place from the first feasts and the latter feasts. You can overlap them also, and there's parallels there, but we, don't, we won't go into, into that today. Um, but right now we need to pray and connect to the eighth day in prayer for an outpouring now for revival. Praise the Lord. Psalm 119. Now remember, on this day uh, is also celebrated in Israel and then in the diaspora the following day, the Simchat Torah. And Simchat Torah is when uh, the Word of God is just celebrated. And it's one of the, it's one of the most joyful festivals and feasts. And, uh, and, and when you see... And if you could just bring that... Uh, Guys, could you just bring that picture up? Uh, this was one that was taken just a few days ago in Jerusalem <coughs> um, of somebody holding the Torah scroll. Uh, if that's available somewhere. It was just there. there we go. So this, this is just a, an image. Uh, just in the background, they're holding the palm branches and the etrog and the, 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 um, uh, the four species and so forth. And uh, So this is the, the Torah scroll that's wrapped up uh, you see those little silver crowns on the, on, the wooden, on the end of the wood there? Some of them have a whole big silver crown right on the top. And what happens is they bring the uh, Word of God out of the ark. So if this was a synagogue, right here, this would be a, like a big cupboard, uh, which would either have a door or a, a curtain in front of it. And they, would, they call that the ark. Inside the ark is housed one of these Torah scrolls. Now remember, the Torah scroll is written painstakingly, uh, word letter by letter by letter by letter. They can't be a mistake. It can't, if it's damaged, they don't throw it away and get a new one. Um, they don't recycle it. <laughs> it is buried in a Jewish burial ground because this word, this, is, this to them is the Messiah at this point. This, the Torah is, he is the, he is the word. And, and this is, they, they treat this, they, they dress it in royal robes with silver crowns to represent the royalty and the, the, what they offer to it. So, so when the, one of these scrolls is, is damaged, they bury it in a Jewish burial ground. It actually gets a, a human burial of sorts. So, so the, the reverence for these, for these books. So you can imagine how, how, what happens uh, and how demonic it is when uh, in different times of, of, of in Spain and when, when the Nazi occupation of Germany, when they went in and just... And, and I'm not even going to tell you the sorts of things they did to the Torah scrolls in front of the Jewish people. So you can imagine what that would, you know, that kind of desecration would have done and meant to them uh, as they were burned and ripped and everything else that was done to them. Um, so this is a very, very, and so when this Torah scroll comes out, there's a tremendous dancing and, and a joy, and they dance all around the synagogue and are out into the streets, and there's, a, there's this joy. And you, it's, it's really fun to see um, you know, the, these um, uh, uh, orthodox rabbis with the pats and the beards, and, you know, I mean, dancing, I mean, really going for I mean, really enjoying themselves and, and just letting loose. And then, and then also, uh, there's a special time when um, there's something called Aliyah, which it, we, a lot of people attribute that to now when people go home to Israel. But the word Aliyah just simply means to come up, uh, to, 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 to come up. So uh, at the Bema, which is where the Torah is read, um, uh, 
often on this particular holiday, everyone in the synagogue, everyone in the community gets a chance to come up and they called up to make Aliyah to read from the Torah, which is you know, uh, given uh, normally uh, there's only a few people that would do that, but everyone gets that, that opportunity. Children as well, to come up and read from the Torah to make Aliyah. Um, now, of course, in the Scriptures, we're told in Revelation chapter 4 that, that Jesus himself says, come up here, make Aliyah. And there'll be a time where we, we go, go to be with him in that particular moment. But Psalm 119 part of the heart behind this absolute love affair with the Word of God that the Jewish people had and that we must have as well. Verse 11, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes and I will not forget your word. That's the heart of Simchat Torah. That's the heart of, of how much we should be absolutely in love with the word of God. When you pick up this word, this is Jesus. He is the Word made flesh. You have the intimate spirit connection with Him so that it's not only this part of Him, but don't forget this part of Him. All Scripture is God ruach, God breathed, God spirited to you. This is supposed to be as much a part of your relationship with Jesus as your prayer life, that you can't separate the two. These words are creative words because they're His words. Jesus is the utterance of God. He is. Praise the Lord. The other thing about this eighth day, which I think is just precious, this Shemini Itzaret, is that it's, the rabbis describe it like when you've just had a party and everyone's just gone home except a couple of close friends just hang around for a little bit longer. And so the rabbis describe it, it's like God had a party and he said, hey, when everyone's gone, just hang around with me just for a little bit longer. And so he gave an eighth day. And that's kind of the, the essence of what this day is about. Um, listen to this. Uh, do you remember, remember Jesus with his disciples? Remember time and time again it said, and when the crowds had gone, the disciples asked him saying, what are you talking about? <laughs> and Jesus would sit there and just go over it with them again. Do you, you know that time, so, some of the sweetest fellowship is doing the dishes with someone after everyone else has gone. Do you know that? It's, it's true. So, some of the sweetest things that have blessed me uh, at the most has been after church and, and people have gone dispersed having whatever and there's people in here talking, having some fellowship, packing away. Sometimes that sweetest fellowship, the sweetest, genuine, loving is in that moment when the crowds are gone and then there's that connection. It's like being in the trenches together. It's something precious about that. Now listen to this. I, I love this. Exodus chapter 33. Look at Joshua. You ever wonder why Joshua got the privilege of taking over from Moses? Those are big sandals to fill. <laughs> Verse 8. So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle, that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. Wow. Verse 10. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door and all the people rose and worshipped each man at his tent door. So the Lord spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend and he would return to the camp. But, look at this, his servant Joshua 
the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. I love that heart of Joshua. After all, I mean Moses, the big man, the man of God, he's having the face to face with God, the Shekinah glory, the presence of God. Everybody's worshiping, and then after a while, oh, this is all wonderful. And everyone goes back to their tents. Even Moses goes back to his tent. Joshua looks around. It's like, hey God, and just has this one on one. I mean, just he just lingers in the presence, just a bit more. I love that. Just stay. Won't you stay just a little bit longer? You know, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's almost like God's, God's heart is that way. Would you just hang around just a little bit longer? Is it, is it really time for you to leave now? Why don't you just, just stay a little bit longer? You know, and I'm convinced it's in those little bit longer times. Just that's, it's in that quietness when, when all the crowd is gone. Some of the most powerful revelations and intimate moments where God exists. Because there, was, there were crowds, there were thousands, tens of thousands of followers of Jesus. With only a few disciples. What's the difference? When, they all, when everyone had gone, they were still there. They were still there. Listen to what Jesus said. John chapter 15. He said, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. He said this, verse 4 Abide in me. That means, that means stay. You, you, that doesn't, abide is different from visiting. Abide means to live there, stay there. Abide in me, and I in you. Can you hear his heart? As the branch cannot bear fruit... Now, this is the wisdom behind it. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they're burned. If you abide, how many times is he saying this now? The same thing. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified. By what? That you bear much fruit. Fruitfulness, increase, glorifies God. And so you will be my disciples. Not followers. Disciples. So you will be my disciples. Verse 9. As the Father... Now, he, he's, now he's going to connect some things right here. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. How do we do that? Verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love. See the connection now between... Shemini et Saret, staying on for the extra eighth day, staying on just that little bit longer, and the joy in the Word of God. He's now connecting his intimate love with his words, with his Torah. If you keep my commandments, you will abide, stay in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you Here's the joy, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy might be full. Praise the Lord. It pays to stay just a little bit longer. I mean, it pays just to hang, hang out and take that extra time. we got after the hustle and bustle, after all of the glitz and the glamour, 
after the lights have dimmed and the sound's been turned off, stay. Hey, you know, that doesn't necessarily even mean you have to stay in this room because Sergeant Scott might have something to say about that on Monday morning because there'll be people in here doing Pilates and all sorts. And if you're still standing here, you might get in their way. But you know, it's not talking about just geographical. It's talk about stay in that place of worship. Stay in that place of praise. So, sometimes it does pay to stay in the same location. Just don't move because you just don't want to focus on anything else. But stay there. Abide there. Commune there with that place. And listen, understand when you're doing it, you are connecting through time, as we study this, with a time when all things will be new. That place of communion you have with God is not even shaped like this time now. That place of communion with God is shaped like the communion that we'll have of fullness. And when you're in that place, you're connected with that no limit type of worship. That's what Jesus called worshipping the Father in spirit and truth. Emet. Emet. Aleph, Mem, Tav. Aleph, Tav, beginning. Mem, the middle letter of all letters. The beginning, middle, and end of all words, of all letters, spells truth. Worshipping Him in spirit and truth. This is how you and I get to connect with this by the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of the purchase possession. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, six pages into a seven-page sermon, you have to kind of call it quits there because... But you don't have to call it quits. You stay. And listen, here's the great thing about today. We get to come back tonight and worship God. We're having a worship service tonight here in this room. We're going to leave all this set up, so don't pack anything up. Don't put the chairs away. We're going to come back tonight and we're just going to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, just because of who He is. And we're just going to stay. Isn't it, isn't it worked out wonderfully? That we just, we, you know what we're going to do? is We're just going to come back tonight and stay just a little bit longer. We're not going to sing that song. But we, <laughs> but we, are, we are going to just linger in His presence tonight. And we're going to rejoice in the Lord our God. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. So make sure you connect with people. You know, if there's people you know uh, who aren't here at church this morning, and there might have been other reasons and things, I'm sure there was, but why they're not here, give them a call. Say, hey, don't miss out on tonight. We're going to come and worship the Lord. If you've got people you know that aren't connected with a church anywhere, tell them, just bring them along. Come and worship God with us. Come and worship the Lord. Come and and just be in His presence uh, this afternoon. So 6 o'clock tonight, we're going to kick off and and start and and just be in His presence. Make sure that you're here. Make sure you prioritize it. Be like Joshua. Come and stay just a little longer in His presence. Amen? Amen? Father, we're so grateful to you for everything that you do in your word and give us in your word and by your Holy Spirit that reveals truth to us, opens up by revelation more and more and more how you want us to linger and be in your presence, how you have connected us with the future. Father, we're connected with the past, we know, by the cross. We're connected with the future as well by your spirit and by your word. And Father, we now live out the fullness. We draw on heaven. We declare and agree with Jesus' prayer that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we connect with that time and we bring it into this time. We we connect with that dimension and we bring it into this dimension. Father, we pray for the rain in the time of latter rain. God, we thank you that you bring that former and that latter rain in this same season. That there would be, and there is, we we by faith pull on that right now that former and latter rain in this time, in this season, by faith we connect with that in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank You for that. We thank You for that pouring, that outpouring, that out of our bellies would flow these rivers of living water. Hallelujah. That we would be the the very conduits, the very vessels of the glory, of the Shekinah glory, of the Kabod glory of God onto and into this earth. And we thank you for that.
in your precious, precious name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. In your presence there is peace. In your presence, in your presence, there is joy. I will linger, I will stay in your presence day by day. That your likeness may be seen in me. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. Praise you, Lord. If you'll just stand for a moment, I'm just going to just speak out the priestly blessing over you as we go in our peace. Yeverecha Adonai ve Ishmerecha, Yeer Adonai Penavilecha Vihunecha, Yesar Adonai Penavilecha Vesaim Lecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, to lift up his countenance upon you, and give you peace. Amen. Have a, have a wonderful time of fellowship together. Remember, continue to abide in him.